And I think there was a lot of obsession for judges to have a consensus. So we end, we end up with a six judge judgment without dissent. I think this court was good to not focus too much on that. Whichever judge wanted to dissent, let them dissent. And, th and eventually you'll have uh, a majority. Obviously there was the risk because at some point the court sat uh, six judges. But at least uh, we feel like the court didn't waste a lot of time uh, trying to achieve uh, consensus. Um, then we also, and this is again a lesson I think from uh, 2013, um, even the judges themselves, beyond the staff of the court, uh, you got a sense they were very well trained. When um, Mr. Masharia, um, I think his uh, lawyer for Kenyatta was asked that question about stray bullets, a uh, stray, uh, stray bullet. <laughs> when he was asked the question about uh, stray votes, right? You know, the approach he seemed to take is to start sort of uh, explaining this to the judges, and obviously he seemed not to have full grasp of the issue. But what became very clear is that the judges knew the answer. They knew the answer, and you got a sense. And that is a very technical, because in that rejected votes uh, arena, you have stray ballots, you have disputed, you have all these manner of um, uh, ballots that you can talk about, and they change. Uh, the definition changed depending on what ballot you're talking about. And a lot of us just like saying rejected ballots. But you could tell the judges knew what they were getting to. So what um, can we, some of the things I think we can expect from the court uh, very quickly, uh, because I have five minutes. Um, I think we can expect that the court will really emphasize on the Constitution as the starting point, and that the Constitution on its own is sufficient to invalidate a uh, presidential election, that you don't need to go into this whether um, the violations uh, affected the results. In fact, the test that the court seems to have uh, put in its brief reasons is whether the violation of the Constitution and the law impacted on the integrity of the election. That is very, very different from the test before, which is whether the irregularities affected the results. So there is more emphasis, or there sh I think there will be more emphasis on the Constitution. I don't, I'm not sure whether the court will change the burden of proof, but I think it will make certain variation, including the variation I talked about, uh, putting more burden uh, on the IBC. Um, I think the court saw through the what I would call the fallacy of agents and observers. You know, we are told that why didn't NASA, for example, uh, bring its results through the agents it had on the field, right? Which means that if you want to run for a presidential election, you cannot expect IBC to deliver for you a, a credible election if you don't have agents. And it's good that uh, Professor Wainaina is here. Because then, for a candidate like Professor Wainaina, how many agents are you going to be able to get across the country? Why would we be paying 55 billion and now 12 billion more and then you tell us we have to have our own security guards guarding the election so that it can be free and fair. And I think the court will likely demolish that fallacy. I think we will also see uh, the shifting of what I call psychological burden of proof. What is psychological burden of proof in my view? It's the burden that show us you can overcome the numbers. Show us you can overcome the numbers, which becomes a very difficult conversation to have if you got 10,000 votes in the country, yet you were entitled also to a credible election. Or you had a difference of 1.4, when in fact there is no way of verifying that those votes were actually genuine. 
Um, we'll also probably see a change in uh, all at, uh, the court addressing itself to changes in the law, the elections law, especially section 83 and uh, section 23 of the Leadership and Integrity Act. That is the uh, provision that seems to uh, give uh, cabinet secretaries ability to even engage in political campaigns. As I end, because um, the things about the nullification, I think, for me, and I think this case was made the last hour of the last day of the argument, when the report came back and it was very clear that IBC by and large sabotaged the scrutiny. And if I was a Supreme Court judge, I would have asked if it had been open process, if it had been free and fair process, why would you sabotage scrutiny? And why would I give you the benefit of the doubt? Whether the difference in numbers was 10 million or was five votes. And I think that is what largely made the case. But I want to end by saying, um, there is, uh, by just disabusing a fallacy that is going uh, on that IBC is uh, using, we are waiting for the judgment. So we can't do anything until we get the judgment, right? First of all, we're waiting for the reasons for the judgment. We already have the judgment. And the judgment is that, uh, and you need to go to whatever, that it was not done in accordance with the Constitution and the law. But this is the uh, clincher. What are we waiting for in the judgment, other than the court setting out what the party said, what it was not convinced about. A lot of the bad things that may have happened, and in fact, from the memorandum of the chair, we know happened, will likely not be in the judgment. They are with IBC. It's the information that IBC withheld, even from the court. So if we are waiting for a judgment to say, who committed what crime will be so disappointed because even the court doesn't have that information because the court was denied that information. So for IBC, I think it's the greatest excuse to be saying we cannot do much until we see the judgment. So how come we could decide the 17th as the date without the full judgment? Thank you.